In no particular order. <laughs> Let me begin by once again thanking the American people for the honor they have bestowed upon me and the responsibility they have once again placed in my hands. I will work hard over the next four years to uphold their trust, to protect our shared values, and to meet our common challenges. To do that, I want our administration to be able to serve the American people as well in the next four years as we have in the past four. I must, therefore, begin by announcing that Leon Panetta, who has been my chief of staff since 1994, will be resigning to return to California. I understand why he wants to return home after so many long years and long hours, but that doesn't make it any easier for me to see him go. No one in recent memory has better served the administration, any administration, or the American people than Leon Panetta in what is perhaps the most difficult of all the jobs in public service in Washington today. As a civil rights official, a distinguished member of Congress, an OMB director, Leon Panetta brought his sharp mind and his huge heart to bear on every task he ever undertook. He became my chief of staff <clears throat> at a difficult time. He leaves with a remarkable record. Deep reduction in the deficit, millions of new jobs, a strong defense of programs for those in need, including food stamps. All these bear Leon's stamp. Just as important as the work he did was the way he did it. He saw our White House staff as a family. They returned his devotion. His easy laugh and his level head kept our priorities straight and our spirits up. He and I have often had the opportunity to wonder at the miracle of America that took us this far. He is a child of immigrants who came to this country in search of a better life and found it in the walnut groves of California. He has become my great friend, more than my countryman, more than my fellow Democrat, more even than my fellow worker. In the language of his people, he is my paisan. <laughs> and I love him very much. To Sylvia, Christopher, Camelo, Jim, Elizabeth, Christina, and the grandchildren, Michael and Elizabeth, I know how proud he is of you, and you must be very proud of him. To succeed Leon Panetta, I wanted someone of stature, intellect, dedication, drive, and the capacity to do this virtually impossible job, both a manager and a leader. I'm proud to announce that I am naming Erskine Bowles as the next White House Chief of Staff. He's combined brilliant business success and dedicated public service. As an investment banker, he recognized that our successes come not just from our big firms, but from small and medium-sized ones, entrepreneurs with energy and ideas. He worked hard to give the opportunity to start new businesses and to expand the ones they were running. When I became president, I wanted to transform the Small Business Administration from a political backwater to an engine of economic growth. Erskine Bowles did it beyond my wildest expectations. He revitalized the SBA. He doubled the loan volume. He dramatically increased loans to women and minority business owners, even as he cut paperwork and trimmed bureaucracy. I then asked him to serve as the Deputy Chief of Staff. He was one of those most responsible for bringing focus and direction to our efforts. Quietly, behind the scenes, he led our effort to educate the public on what was at stake in last year's budget fight. Through it all, he became my close friend and trusted advisor. He returned to North Carolina last year to be with his family, to start a new business, and continue his work for the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, which he had previously served as president. I know how much Erskine Bowles loves private life. I know that I have asked from him a real sacrifice, and not only from him, but also from his wife, Crandall, and his children, Sam, Ann, and Bill. But his country needs him, and I need him. I have absolute faith in his ability to do this job. He will bring discipline, focus, and deep values to the work. He will help us finish the job the American people sent us here to do. 
In a sense, this is a homecoming for him, for Erskine is a part of our family here, and I'm happy to have him back. As Leon will tell you, <clears throat> I expect a lot of the Chief of Staff. I kept Leon Panetta up until 6 o'clock in the morning, election morning, playing hearts. <laughs> yes, Erskine Bowles can play hearts. <laughs> he also plays golf, but he plays golf better than he plays hearts. I prefer to focus on his hearts playing. <laughs> it has become more apparent than ever that our country is moving forward with confidence and vigor toward the 21st century. It has become more apparent than ever since the election that the American people want us to fulfill our responsibilities as Democrats, Republicans, and Independents second and Americans first, to set aside our differences and join hands to make the most of this moment of possibility. That's how we achieved so much at the end of the past Congress. Just think of what happened. Historic welfare reform, a minimum wage increase, dramatic expansion of pension opportunities for people in small businesses, the adoption tax credit, the extension of the Brady Bill to cover incidences of domestic violence, the kennedy Kassebaum health care reform bill that lets people keep their health insurance as they change jobs or when someone in the family has been sick, an end to the drive-by pregnancies and deliveries where people are kicked out of the hospital after only 24 hours, help for families with mental health needs, and assistance to Vietnam veterans' children with spina bifida. All this happened and shows you what we can do if we work together to give our people the tools they need to make the most of their own lives. It's a good sign for America that all parties now say they want to reach common ground. And I want us to forge a partnership to produce results for the American people. On Tuesday, our people voted for the ideas of the Vital American Center. Now let us make that vital center the place for the vigorous actions to move us into the 21st century. We should begin with our most pressing challenges, balancing the budget, giving our children the world's best education, opening wide the doors of college to everyone willing to work for them, finishing the job of welfare reform, passing real campaign finance reform. Nothing is more fundamental than balancing the budget. Our progress has already produced lower interest rates, steady growth, expanded home ownership. Now we must keep our economy going steady and strong by finishing the job of balancing the budget in a way that truly reflects our values. I am inviting the bipartisan leadership of Congress to meet with me next week here at the White House to discuss how we can develop a plan together to pass a balanced budget and to keep our economy going. I've asked Leon Panetta and OMB Director Frank Raines to coordinate this effort. I want these negotiations to cover a broad range of issues involved in balancing the budget, including strengthening the Medicare Trust Fund, cuts in spending, and a tax cut. I believe our highest priority must be education, especially college opportunities. As I told the American people, we should make the 13th and 14th years of education as universal as a high school group diploma is today. So I will work to see to it that this balanced budget includes the education tax cuts I outlined during the campaign, which had very broad and overwhelming support among the American people. I will also discuss with the congressional leadership how we can, act, how we can enact bipartisan campaign finance reform as soon as possible. We clearly have a unique moment of opportunity now when the public and you and the press are focused on this issue. Now is the time to seize it before the moment fades. The American people will be watching to see whether our deeds match our words. The lesson of our history is clear. When we put aside partisanship, embrace the best ideas regardless of where they come from, and work for principal compromise, we can move America not left or right, but forward. That is what I am determined to do. Now, I want to take your questions, but first I'd like to give Mr. Panetta and Mr. Bowles a chance to just uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, for your kind words and for your leadership, and most of all, for your friendship. Uh, Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, is a great honor and a great privilege. What I also found out was that it's one of the toughest and most challenging jobs in the country. 
But my Italian immigrant parents taught me well. They came here because they wanted to give their children a better life and fulfill the American dream. But they also knew that the price of our freedom and our liberty is duty to nation. I've had the honor of serving this nation for almost 30 years in public life as an officer in the U.S. Army, as a legislative assistant to a U.S. Senator, as director of the U.S. Office for Civil Rights, as a U.S. Congressman from the Great Central Coast in California for 16 years, as director of the Office of Management and Budget, and now as Chief of Staff to the President of the United States. Uh, I am proud of my service and particularly proud of the work that I have done for this President with regards to the budget and his great record on deficit reduction. That's something I will be particularly proud of being a part of. This has been a great and wonderful journey that has satisfied both my mind and my soul. But now it's time to satisfy my heart. And my heart has always been with my wife and my family, with my hometown of Monterey, and with my home state of California. To Erskine, uh, you are a great choice for this job. Get lots of sleep. And always remember that he likes to win at hearts. Uh, I also want to express my deepest thanks to many of those that supported me on this journey. And to my wife, Sylvia, uh, next year, 35 years of marriage in July. Uh, to my three sons, Chris, Carmelo, and Jim, and their families for their support, their love, and perhaps most of all, their patience. To my personal staff, uh, all of whom have served me both in the Congress as well as uh, at the present, in the present position. They've been able to improve their resumes as I went from job to job. Uh, but I couldn't have asked for a staff uh, to give me greater loyalty. To the White House staff, particularly to my deputies, Harold Ickes, Evelyn Lieberman, uh, I have to say to all of the staff that despite the incredible pressure of work and time and oftentimes the unfair political attacks. You have all stood tall. I think you are the most dedicated and effective team I have had the honor of working with. And you have done both your nation and your president proud. And most of all, to you, Mr. President, your great strength is not just in your great accomplishments for this country or in your dreams for the future. It's not in, in your great mind or the work and commitment that you have to this job. I believe that your greatest strength is that you have never lost touch with common people, the common people of this nation, their hopes, their dreams, and their aspirations. That's why you won on Tuesday. That's why I'm proud to have been a part of this administration. Thank you for, and thank you on behalf of my parents for giving me the chance to fulfill the American dream. I am truly honored to have been asked by President Clinton to return to serve him as he serves the American people. The President is someone I know well, whom I deeply admire and respect. Public service is something that has been a way of life in my family for a long, long time. My family has been so supportive of me as we together have reached this enormous decision for me to once again return to Washington and leave my family behind in North Carolina. My wife, Crandall, my three children, Sam, Ann, and Bill, all tried to get here today, but those of you who are here in Washington can see the, the weather, and they are grounded in Charlottesville. So clearly my heart is there, as it always will be. Now, Leon Panetta, has been an extraordinarily effective chief of staff. And he does, without question, leave some very, very big shoes to be filled. 
I was most fortunate to have the chance to work for and learn from Leon Panetta and his staff for almost a year and a half. The White House staff that Leon described and that the President and Leon assembled, many of whom are, are friends and former colleagues of mine, I believe are among the most effective, loyal, and hardworking in the history of the presidency. They have done this president and our country proud. The assets that I hope to give to President Clinton and his administration are the same ones that have served me so well throughout my career in both the public and private sectors of the economy. They are centered around organization, structure, and focus. I believe in working in a bipartisan manner. I believe in cooperating for the common good. And I believe in having an administration that has clearly defined goals, objectives, and timelines such that it and its people can be held accountable. Over the next few weeks, I will spend my time working hard to ensure a smooth and seamless transition from President Clinton's first term to his second. And I will also spend a great deal of time trying to implement an organization structure that will enable all of us to work throughout this administration as effectively and efficiently as possible. I am truly excited about this job. Having served as Deputy Chief of Staff, I know full well the obstacles and opportunities that lie ahead. Mr. President, I look forward to going to work, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this opportunity to once again serve my country. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Elected. This is an inauspicious beginning. You're leaving me in my hour of need. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. The election is over. You do have the support of the American people for a second term. But some questions remain. One of them is, uh, how do you explain the obsession uh, with fundraising, uh, especially from dubious Asian sources? And how do you overcome the image created by your opponent that you are a president who cannot be trusted? Let me answer the second question first. I think the American people, <clears throat> since they've been hearing this for five years, took a long, hard look at it. And they measured that against what they saw in terms of the work of this administration, in terms of the people who were laboring hard to make their lives better, and in terms of the president. And I think they made their judgment that uh, I have worked hard for them, I will keep working hard for them, and that that is my motivation for being here. And I think that they gave me their trust, and I'm going to do my best to be worthy of it. Now, with regard to the <clears throat> contribution issue, uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party raised a lot of money under the rules which now exist. Uh, the Democratic Party received over a million different contributions in two years. Uh, they determined uh, two things. One is that <clears throat> a relatively small number of them, I think, the, I don't know exactly what the number is, but quite a small number out, out of a million, uh, they should not have taken and they have returned them. They also, the Democratic Party said that they thought they should have a tighter screen on uh, contributions when they come in and they've implemented uh, improvements so that they won't receive contributions they shouldn't, shouldn't if they can determine it at all. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I, think both, I think the Republican Party should have the same rules. But the real thing that, that I would say here is I'd like to make two other points. First and far and away the most important point is that this has shown us once again that our campaigns cost too much, they take too much time, they raise too many questions, and now's the time for bipartisan campaign finance reform legislation. I supported the McCain-Feingold bill last year. 
Uh, the leaders of the other party did not, we, and uh, it did not pass. Today, I reaffirm my support for McCain-Feingold, and I am prepared to, to do whatever is necessary to pass it as soon as possible uh, with an amendment that, uh, that uh, our party has agreed to, uh, saying that uh, we should not have uh, contributions from foreign nationals who are otherwise, who, are, who can legally give money now. Uh, I am prepared to do that. I called uh, Senator McCain yesterday and Senator Feingold. I had a good conversation with both of them, and I asked them for their best advice about where to proceed. Uh, I assured them that I would support this legislation, that the, uh, the, our party would support it, and that we had more than enough votes in our caucus to guarantee it an overwhelming victory. So the question now is basically for the leaders uh, of the Republican majority in Congress, whether they will support it. Uh, either right now or uh, as soon as we come into session uh, next year, but I am prepared to go forward. And I think that's the most important thing. Now, let me just make one final comment. Uh, a lot of, I thought, uh, the questions have been raised about these contributions and any questions that have been raised, we should do our best, the Democratic Party should do its best to answer. Any questions you ask of us, we should do our best to answer. But there was a, in your question and in a lot of the things that have happened, uh, in the aftermath, there's this uh, an almost disparaging reference to Asians. And uh, in the last few weeks, a lot of Asian Americans who have supported our campaign have come up to me and said, you know, I'm being made to feel like a criminal. All these people are calling me. Didn't I say, why are you calling me? They said, because you have an Asian last name. And I, maybe I don't need to do this, but I would like to remind everybody here and throughout the country that that our country has been greatly enriched by the work of Asian Americans. They are. Uh, famous for working hard for family values and for giving more than they take. And uh, I frankly am grateful for the support that I have received from them. And so I, that's, I just want to make that clear. I think that there's been a lot of uh, rather expansive, I don't mean that you did, Helen, but there has been a lot of rather disparaging comments made about uh, Asian Americans. And it's ironically, I, I found it surprising that our friends on the other side did because historically they have received more votes from Asian Americans than we have. May I say as a point of rebuttal, I certainly didn't mean to. I know you didn't. No, but also there was also the question of whether uh, the Indonesian contributions may have affected our policy. Well, now that's a different. Then the, the answer to that is absolutely not. Indeed, look at the difference in my policy and the pre my predecessor's policy. We changed our policy on arms sales uh, because of East Timor, not to sell small arms, and we co-sponsored the resolution in the United Nations. Uh, in favor of greater human rights uh, for East Timor. And I, I'm proud that we did that. So I can tell you categorically that there was no influence. By the way, all kinds of people talk to me about policy. Polish Americans, Hungarian Americans, Jewish Americans, Irish Americans talk to me about policy. Uh, citizens that I, uh, people I meet around the world in the course of my travels on your behalf talk to me about it. But in the end, I always do what I believe is right for the American people. Mr. Mr. President, Attorney General Reno is considering whether to appoint an independent counsel to investigate these allegations of improper fundraising by your campaign. She says that she's caught. Wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> there have been no allegations about improper fundraising. Well, That's Democratic. correct. Okay, by but the Democratic but Party. Let's. Uh, she says that she's caught. That was the other rock. campaign that had problems with that, not mine. Uh, General Reno says she's caught between a rock and a hard place, and that she'll be criticized no matter what she does. I know that it's her decision, but what do you think? Do you think that these, these allegations uh, should be investigated by an independent counsel? And secondly, do you think that uh, General, would you like to see General Reno stay on for a second term? I think on the first question, I should have no comment on that. On the second question, I should have no comment on any personnel decision until I have had a chance to meet with the cabinet members in question and uh, work through all the decisions. And I think I should have a uniform uh, policy on that which I have followed to date and which I will continue to follow. Wolf? Uh, getting back to the first question, Mr. President, a lot of questions have been raised, though, about your personal relationship with John Wong, who was the DNC fundraiser who went out to the Asian American community and raised some of the money that had to be returned, as well as with the Riyadi family in Jakarta, uh, James Riyadi in particular, who came to the White House on several occasions. What exactly was your relationship with John Wong and with the Riyadi family? I believe the first time I met John Wong, I believe, was uh, 
several years ago in uh, Taiwan when I was a governor on a trade mission. I, I believe that is correct. Uh, he might have a better memory than I do, but I think that's right. Uh, I met uh, James Riotti when he came to uh, Arkansas to live and work <clears throat> when he was partners, uh, he, when his uh, family and his family's business group were partners with uh, the Stevens interest in Arkansas in a, uh, in a bank there. And he, he and his wife lived there and I got to know them when, uh, several years ago. So I have known both uh, James Riotti and his wife and John Huang and his wife for several years. Uh, and I knew them primarily in the context of my work as governor, uh, both in, in inside Arkansas and dealing with the economic issues within the state, and then in my work as governor of Arkansas and going to Taiwan, which parenthetically was one of the, uh, is one of the biggest purchases of uh, soybeans, which is a big product in my home state of any uh, country in the world. So I was there quite often, I think five times during the course of my governorship. And uh, that's how I knew them. So I had a personal relationship with them that went back uh, several years. And long before there was any politics or, or uh, even contributions or anything like that involved, I had known them for several years. It was a mistake for you to appoint John Wong to a Commerce Department of, uh, uh, position, Assistant Secretary of Commerce, given the relationship he had with the Lippo conglomerate in Indonesia and his business interests in the past? Well, I believe... I don't believe so as soon as, I don't think so, not as long as, as uh, the clearances and the, uh, and the search of, of all the records and the, and the business uh, disclosures, if they were all appropriate. You know, there are all kinds of standards for that, that anybody who gets a, an appointment that they have to be uh, confirmed for has to meet. And if they were, I wouldn't say so. I mean, keep in mind, one of the, one of the jobs of the Department of Commerce and perhaps one of the most important jobs now, and one which Ron Brown did very well, is to open new opportunities for American businesses around the world, to open new markets for American businesses, to create jobs by doing that. And uh, one of the great advantages the United States has over virtually every other country in the world is that we have living here in our country citizens who are from everywhere else and who have business ties and contacts and deep understandings of the cultures and the economies of uh, every other country in the world. And so assuming that, uh, that all the proper disclosures were made and all the proper clearances were, uh, were had, I mean, the government has rules for that, I would think that, that uh, that's the sort of person we would be looking for, someone who did have good contacts and, could, and did have a general understanding of international commerce. Yes? Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, despite your promises earlier to pull out of Bosnia next month, the Pentagon now says that U.S. troops will remain there at least until the end of March. Is it possible you would keep U.S. troops there beyond March as part of a follow-on peacekeeping force if NATO decides they are needed? Well, let me explain, first of all, what the, the March deadline is. We have already begun moving some people out, and uh, the December, we, you know, we said that the, the mission, the I-4 mission, would take about a year. But uh, <clears throat> the, as the Pentagon can explain in greater detail and specificity than I, you can't just up and pull people out in one day. There has to be a phase down, and people have to be brought in to help move out the people that have been there the, the whole time. So the March date is just the time the last people who are part of a, a three-and-a-half-month phase down will leave. Now, separate and apart from that, NATO has been asked to consider the question of whether... Uh, well, let me make other, one other point. Look at what... I-4 went there to establish a buffer zone between the ethnic groups and to make sure that uh, during this time uh, elections could be held and, and basic security could be maintained along the border areas, not to be actually involved in law enforcement. And I think they've done their job very well. I am very pleased with it. I'm very pleased with the cooperation between the NATO allies and Russia and the other non-NATO countries. And I think that uh, it has helped the Bosnian peace process to take hold. And we have had elections. A lot has been done. The, what, what NATO has been asked to consider is whether or not, since the economic reconstruction has not taken hold as fast as we had hoped, uh, and there's still <clears throat> obviously some hard feelings there between the parties, we should consider a, a smaller, different force that might have a more limited mission than the I-4 mission that NATO would be involved in. 
Uh, I have taken, I, I believe the position I've taken on that is the position that the other NATO leaders have taken, the leaders of the other NATO countries, which is we would like to see the proposed mission. We would like to see what our contribution would be. Uh, I want to assess the risks, as I always do, and the, and the possible benefits, and then I will make a judgment. I have, I took a long look at the I-4 mission. Um, we, we worked very hard to define it in a way that would guarantee uh, the maximum possibility for success and the minimum possibility of danger to our forces. It has worked very well. Whether we could do this, as I said uh, all along, would depend on what the nature of the mission is. I'm looking forward to the NATO report. I haven't received it yet. When I do, I will tell you exactly what the recommendations are and what my best judgment on them is. It is conceivable that we could participate, but it depends upon uh, exactly what uh, the recommendation is. Yes, sir, and then we'll go back. Up. Go ahead. You're in the process of choosing your, your team now for the next administration. You were criticized four years ago for your failure to go ahead with your stated intentions to choose at least one Republican for a top post. You were criticized for putting too much emphasis on diversity and also for, for relying too much on friendship. In some case, friends got into ethical problems. Do you feel you must be more tough-minded this time around? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think the cabinet that I've had has done very well. And on average, I believe their tenure of service far exceeds the average tenure of service uh, in the modern era. And I believe that we have proved that you could have diversity as well as excellence, not only in the cabinet but in the federal bench, where I've made the most diverse appointments in terms of women and minorities in history, and yet they have the highest ratings from the American Bar Association, my appointees do, of any president since the rating system began. So I don't see a conflict between excellence and diversity, but I would extend that diversity to uh, Republicans as well. I think we ought to try to have a government that can unify the country. And uh, I did want to put, uh, badly want to put a Republican in the cabinet the last time. I had one in particular in mind who uh, declined for personal reasons, who I think wanted to serve, and I regret that. And uh, so I have not ruled out that. In fact, I'm a, I have cast a very wide net in looking for people to serve in this administration, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we had uh, Republican representation. I certainly hope we will. Peter, and then uh, Rita was next, and then Peter. I'm sorry. Um, speaking of what people will be doing in the next administration, when you ran for your first term, you talked a lot about the first lady's role, but we didn't hear so much about it during this run for the reelection. Can you give us a sense of what she'll be doing in the next term? And also, I wondered whether you have thought about whether you intend to offer Bob Dole any chance to serve. Well, let me answer the, the question about Hillary. I think that what the First Lady will do is something that uh, I think it will be consistent with what she's been doing, but we have not, uh, frankly, we've been too tired to talk about it. Uh, yesterday, I'm embarrassed to tell the American people I actually slept past noon. <laughs> I was tired, and so we, we hadn't had much chance to talk about it. But I think that my, my assumption would be that whatever she did, was she would be working on uh, the issues of, that relate to children and families that she spent most of her life uh, doing, and so that's what I would think. But we have not had a chance to talk about it. You want to well, well the, but I think I'm, I must not have spoken all that clearly on that. What I meant about welfare is this: the welfare reform legislation is is uh, law now. Let me just talk about that just a minute, and then I'll come back to your other question. What the welfare reform bill says is this: <clears throat> it says from now on. The United States government will guarantee to poor families medical care and nutrition, and if a person moves from welfare to work, then more for child care than ever before. But that portion of the federal money that used to go with state money into a monthly welfare check will now go to the states, and they have two years to figure out how to turn the welfare check into a paycheck. Now, I think what's important is <clears throat> to recognize that that's, what the, that's all the bill does then all the states and all the communities of this country have to figure out how to do that. And what, what I think is important is that we, we all be aggressive in figuring out how to do that in ways that work for the children, not that there should be a, um, a role for the first lady or anybody else, but children's advocates in particular want to make sure that this is a pro-family transition. That's all I meant, and I believe it will be. I feel good about it. Um, in terms of uh, anything for Senator Dole to do, I think to be fair to him, uh, even though I am standing up here and on both feet giving this press conference today, uh, after a campaign like this, you need time to decompress whether you win or, or whether you lose. And I've been on both sides of this in my life. And um, he said 
something I really appreciated when we had our personal conversation uh, on election evening. He said, uh, you know, and after a while, after I get uh, rested up and you do, and we get, uh, we'll come by, I'll come by and we'll have a cup of coffee and we'll talk about uh, just to have a visit. And I said, I'd really like that. And I think that uh, I would just urge all of you to, uh, to give him and Mrs. Dole a little space here and, uh, and let them get rested up and think about their lives and what they want to do. And, and uh, there'll be time for that. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas is coming up. But I can, test, I can attest to the fact that based on the vigorous campaign he ran, not just in the last 96 hours, but in the throughout, that, uh, that uh, if he so chooses, he's got a lot left to give his country. But I think that should be his decision. We should let, let a little time go by. Peter, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, sir. As you uh, reflect on the past four years and look ahead to the next four, what are your thoughts about the emotional, legal, and even financial toll that these investigations over the past four years have taken and continue to take on people who are uh, very close to you? Do you see any remedy for it, and do you see any end to it? Well, I think that <clears throat> nearly every objective observer who's looked at it believes that progressively over the last however many years we have attended to uh, turn our political differences into legal battles in ways that have uh, enormous uh, cost, human cost for the people involved in them and, and for our democracy. But I think, uh, frankly, I think at this, given the posture in which some of these things are in, uh, it, it, I'm not the person to be making recommendations on a resolution of it. Uh, I, there are others who are writing about it. I noticed uh, there was a, a woman who uh, worked for both uh, Mr. Fisk and Mr. Starr who wrote an article and won a legal periodical in the last month or so, uh, arguing for some changes in the way these matters are dealt with. Uh, there are a lot of people who are troubled by this and are thinking about it, but I think that uh, I think that at least for the time being that uh, it's not for me to be the one who's suggesting what should be done. But a lot of people, I think, in both parties who care about it are concerned about uh, the, the cost of this as compared with uh, any benefit that comes from it. Yes? What are your thoughts, though, on the toll that it has taken on those closest to you? Well, I hate it. I obviously hate that. And the thing I really hate is that it was when people that are completely innocent are basically confronted with a presumption of guilt and told to prove their innocence of charges they're not quite sure what they're supposed to do. You know, it's difficult. But, you know, right now, in my heart's full of gratitude. I, I told you that, that, that as far as I'm concerned, for me, it doesn't bother me because, I mean, I wouldn't say it doesn't bother me, but it's just part of being in public life today. But uh, we should never be happy when innocent people suffer unnecessarily. That's, that's not good. No one can be possibly for that. So we need to try to see uh, you know, we seek out people's opinion about what should be done, but I don't think it's for me to be discussing that now. Mr. President, you spoke in your opening remarks about the moment being now for uh, campaign finance reform. In light of the recent controversies in both parties, would you be willing to commit to the idea that campaign fundraising not be done as closed events but be open for news coverage as a means of, sh of uh, putting more sunshine on the process? You know, you're the first person that ever asked me that. I'll, let me just say this. I, I'll be glad. I'd like to have some chance to think about it, but um, I mean, I, I've never, I've never been asked it before, and I've never thought about it much. But I have, you know, a lot of our fundraisers are open, and most of the smaller events we have are just are, are basically round robin discussions uh, from people who very often come from very different perspectives on issues. Uh, but I, I will think about it. I will give you an answer. I'd like to think about it. Go, go ahead. Just. Uh, Sarah, I'll come to you next. Go ahead. Getting back to the subject of all these legal investigations, has the First Lady been notified by Kenneth Starr's office that she is either the subject or a target of any of his investigations? No. Yes, sir. Not to my knowledge. Now you've got to keep yourself from secrets that other people try to keep from you in government. I refer to the secrecy that surrounds the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department and those people in government and the Defense Department who sometimes try to work and keep secrets from you. How are you going to keep yourself from being insulated? Well, <clears throat> frankly, the only way to do that, there are only two ways to do that. One is I have to, to appoint good people in positions in those departments who are in a position to know what is going on or to find out if I need to know. Or there has to be some external way of knowing, which means that all of you have to find out so that I can uh, either see it or read it or hear it on the news. 
or we have to have or, or some independent commission uh, if a particular problem or question is hanging out there should press further. Uh, I think the, uh, let me just say, I think the commission I appointed on Gulf War illnesses has done an exemplary job. And I believe that uh, the Pentagon, in fairness, has also done much better recently. And uh, we have done, as, as I think all of you know, we've given free medical exams to tens of thousands of people. We've qualified 26,000 people for disability, and uh, we have a lot of various medical tests going on. That all came about, I believe, in large measure because the American people kept demanding a response. And so I put this commission together, and they did their job. And then the Pentagon, as I said, Secretary Perry, having seen the evidence, uh, has moved in an expeditious fashion. But I think those are the ways. There aren't, there's never any magic about that. The president has to have good people in those agencies. They have to be able to find out the truth. And then if, if you do your job, and then if some real big problem arises and a, a group of citizens can look into it, uh, we normally find a way to make our democracy work. Ken? Go ahead, Ken. Ken and then Susan, go ahead. Mr. President, one of the lingering areas of hard feelings from the campaign is over your and the Democratic Party's attacks on the Republicans over Medicare. Since you're going to meet with the Republican leadership next week, how will you encourage them to be conciliatory and trust you now over Medicare, given the, the damage they incurred in the campaign over the issue? <clears throat> well, first of all, there are always a lot of hard feelings after every campaign. I mean, I, you know, I, I believe that what I said about the Medicare uh, provisions of the budget I vetoed was accurate and true and fair, and I cannot retract that. Um, I do not believe the, the picture they painted of the budget I passed, which sparked America's economic recovery, is fair. By any reasonable standard, it wasn't the biggest tax increase in history. Average people did not pay as much as they said they paid. I mean, there were lots of problems I had with that. But that wouldn't stop me from working with them on the budget. And uh, so, you know, we obviously don't always agree with each other's characterization of our positions. I don't agree with a lot of their characterizations, of, uh, but that wouldn't stop me from working with them. And I would say uh, that the, my answer to you is that the way to put this behind us is to reach an agreement. And I'm prepared to reach out and meet them halfway. And if you, I think the way to go forward is to pick up where we left off. As I said and acknowledged to everyone, including in, for Senator Dole, when we ended the budget negotiations, when, it, when they had to stop, in fairness to him, because he had to begin his presidential campaign, at the time when they ended, we were actually quite close to an agreement. And the differences between us were entirely manageable. And I could see how we could build a bridge between our two positions that would give us a balanced budget plan. So the obvious answer here is just to, to go forward by picking up where we left off with the Republican position and with our administration position. And I think, you know, we can have an agreement in next to no time. And that would be my uh, advice on that. Yes, Susan, go ahead and then I'll take Mr. this. Mr. President, we know that you're an avid student of presidential history. And in modern times, second terms for presidents have been either disappointing or disastrous. I wonder if you've drawn any lessons on why that's so. <laughs> And if there are any pitfalls in particular that you are determined to avoid for yourself. Yes. Actually, I read a book not very long ago on second term. There's a book that's just been written on second term presidencies. And I was a little nervous about reading it for the election. I was, but I, long toward the end, I, I read it. And, uh, and I got to thinking in my own mind about the second terms. Uh, you know, President Truman's second term, President Eisenhower's second term. Uh, and, and President Reagan's second term, and then the others <clears throat> uh, in the 20th century especially I focused on. What the record shows is that the things which derail a second term are basically three. Uh, one is some external event intervenes and the president can't fulfill his dreams or hopes or his agenda. Two is, um, I mean, apart from the uh, obvious case. The, the second thing that happens is sometimes a president thinks he has more of a mandate than he does and tries to do too much in the absence of cooperation. That was the rap on President Roosevelt's second term, that his first, third, his first and third terms were greater than his second term because of that. Uh, and the third is that <clears throat> sometimes a president essentially just runs out of steam. That, uh, that was the rap that, that was attempted to be put on President Reagan, although I would remind you that in President Reagan's second term, 
He signed the tax reform legislation and the first uh, big welfare reform overhaul, which was quite a good bill. Uh, but so what, what we have done to try to avoid that is, number one, make it clear that we understand the American people want us to work together with the Republicans and that we have to build a, a vital center. And number two, to have a driving agenda for the second term that grows out of what we've done for the last four years. That's why I went out of my way at the Democratic National Convention when I was speaking to the Convention of the American People to list a very long list of specific things I wanted to do because I wanted, to, to, I wanted an agenda to organize the attention, the spirits, and the energies of people. I think when people stay busy, they do, they do good things, uh, and I, I think that, that that will very much help. So we have a big agenda. We have a driving agenda. We know what we have to do. And if we keep good, energetic people involved, I think we'll, we'll be able to avoid those pitfalls. But I'm very mindful of history's difficulties, and I'm going to try to beat them. <laughs> yes, Jim? Go ahead. No. Speaking of hard feelings, as you did just a moment ago, Senator Alphonse D'Amato only yesterday said that uh, the Senate whitewater hearings were over. And he said that the American people didn't want to see Congress going out on any fishing expeditions. What do you make of what Senator D'Amato said, and, and do you think it signals that Republicans may ease up a little bit on some of the investigations that were aimed at the White House? I don't know. Uh, all I can tell you is uh, I imagine they will have debates in their party about what they should do. It's clear to me what the American people said. It's clear to me what the people of New York said. It's clear to me what but even in the states that I did not carry, you know, it, uh, we, lost, what, we lost Georgia by 10,000 or 15,000 votes or something. This country was divided as to just exactly which way to tilt, but they were collected around the idea that we needed to keep making progress, but do it by working together from the center. And I think that's what Senator D'Amato recognized. And if that is the majority view within the Republican caucus and the Senate and the House, the American people will be very well pleased by the work we do together. We will get a lot done. And, and would you expect any relief from the Republican investigations? Well, what I, would respect, what I would respect is if we all spend our time and energy working on uh, balancing the budget, on opening educational opportunities, on advancing uh, health care reform step by step, on continuing the fight against crime, on, 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 on the things that we need to be doing together. That's what I think we ought to do. And I think the American people would be elated if we both sides seem to be putting our politics down, waiting for the next election, and really working like crazy to get something done for our country. I think they would like it, and I'm prepared to do it, and, then th and I hope that they will be. And I was very encouraged by, by my conversation with Senator Lott and with my conversation with Speaker Gingrich, and I was encouraged by what Senator D'Amato said. We'll just have to, we'll have to see what happens. I very much hope it'll be that way. Mike, <laughs> then we'll go over here. Yes, go ahead. Do you plan on looking at ways to reform the Social Security system in the next four years? Well, I think that goes back to the Medicare question one of you asked. I think it's with Ken, I guess. That's up. I believe we have to find a bipartisan framework to look at the longer, the, if you will, the baby boom issues presented in Social Security and Medicare. And as I said, I think there has to be some sort of commission, some sort of functioning bipartisan way of looking at that. But that must not be an excuse for any of us, including me, to avoid doing what it takes right now to put a decade of life on the Medicare trust fund. In other words, we need to fix Medicare for a decade right now, and we have agreed upon savings that will do that. And we lost a year last year. Thank goodness it didn't hurt us too bad because the inflation rate dropped so much in medical costs. But we don't need to lose another year. We, we ought to make an agreement now, put a, put a decade of life on the Medicare trust fund, and then agree upon a bipartisan mechanism that could look at what what things can be done, <clears throat> which wouldn't be particularly dramatic if we move now, to deal with the problems that uh, Social Security will encounter in the third decade of the next century, and the problems that Medicare will encounter when all the baby boomers go on it. But those, those things can be, ch can be salvaged and resolved in a, with modest changes if we move now because it's so far into the future. But, but, not, but that kind of a bipartisan mechanism cannot and must not be used to uh, avoid 
dealing with the Medicare trust fund problem that exists right now. John, and then we'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, follow up, and then we'll do this one, then I'll go over here. Yeah. The yeah. last time there was a bipartisan commission to look into the long-term reform of Social Security in 1983, among the reforms that came out was the raising of taxes and the raising of the uh, retirement age el eligibility. Would you be open to those possibilities if that became the recommendation of a new commission? I think it would be. Well, the reason you have a commission is so you don't have to jump the gun on trying to make decisions. But let me mention, let's just, I, my view is it would be unwise to raise the payroll tax anymore. It is already quite high, and it is a, is a regressive tax. Most of our new jobs are coming from small businesses. If you start a small business, you have to pay the payroll tax whether you make any money or not. You don't have to pay income tax unless you're actually making money. And if you look at the job machine in America and where most of these jobs are coming, and you look at the fact that the payroll tax is quite high, I, th I think it would be difficult for us to do it. And I also believe if we start now, it will not be necessary. In terms of the age, keep in mind, we have already, uh, the 83 commission got an agreement to raise the age from 65 to 67. Because when, when Social Security was instituted, the average life expectancy was less than 65. You didn't even have a 50-50 chance to draw Social Security when it started. Now, if you get to be 65 in America, you're living in the group of seniors with the highest life expectancy in the world. So we're going up to 67. I think I, I would, to go beyond that, the question would be, there are two issues there. One is, could you accelerate the, the latter, you know, it's a, like a month a year now, could it go to two months a year? That's one question. The other question would be, if you went beyond that, it'd be, it might be fine for somebody like me, you know, who's always had a, a, a desk job, but what about the people who have uh, laboring jobs? What about people who really work with their hands and their backs, and would that be too burdensome for them? That would be my concern there. Go ahead, John. Mr. And then we'll come over here. When yes. the questions came up earlier this afternoon about questionable campaign finance contributions, you took pains to say these were Democratic National Committee matters. But with all due respect, you name the co-chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Much of what they did this year was in furtherance of your reelection and that of uh, other Democrats. Don't you feel some responsibility or accountability for what was done in I, your name? Well, first of all, we are doing, I believe that the Democratic Committee is doing the right thing by returning any contributions that were improperly tendered to it. And I, I certainly feel responsible to do that, and I would not tolerate their not doing it. Furthermore, I think uh, Senator Dodd and Chairman Fowler did the right thing in trying to, if you will, develop a tighter screen for evaluating it. They, uh, they acknowledged that they should have had a better screen, that, these, that they were, you know, as I said, they took in over a million contributions over two years from different people and that they found these relatively small number that were wrong, and they should do it. And, I, and had that not been done, I would absolutely feel responsible for it uh, because I am a Democrat, and I'm the titular head of the Democratic Party. So I, I'm not trying to disclaim responsibility, but I am trying to point out that there is a, uh, there's a difference between what the party does and what the campaign does. I'm also responsible for what the campaign does in, in that sense, but there is a difference, and the 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 party should do the right thing and give any money back. But, and I also pointed out, again, the Republicans have their own problems here and have had some in, in both campaign and in party raising, in campaign, presidential campaigns and in party raising. But all of them, when you add them up, it's, I'll say something in behalf of the Republicans. If, if they raise money from a million people over two years, it's, it, it would not surprise me if 10 to 20 of those contributions were, did not meet the requirements of the law, or 30, and it would be a small percentage. And that doesn't mean that we ought to run them out of town on a rail. But what, what I do know is that if you have to raise this kind of money, and they raised, what did they raise, $150 million more than we did. They raised $3 for every $2 we did. If you raise this kind of money, you're, you're gonna, the questions will be raised about it. And they're, the only way to ever put this to rest is to pass campaign finance reform. We have a vehicle that I think is as good as any. There is no perfect solution to this because of two Supreme Court decisions, one of which says nobody can limit how much money you spend on the campaign or how much of your money you spend. The other one gives, appears to give a wide berth to these third-party expenditure committees. But still, the McCain-Feingold bill, with a modification to deal with the foreign contribution issue, would dramatically improve things. 
Now, I am for it. The Democratic Party is on record for it. The chairman of the Democratic Committee has challenged the chairman of the Republican Committee to endorse it. Uh, Senator McCain was very active in Senator Dole's campaign. It is completely bipartisan. And we have enough votes in our caucus in the Senate and the House to contribute to an overwhelming victory. So now the real question is, where do we get McCain-Feingold is solely within the purview of the leaders of the House and the Senate on the Republican side. If they'll go with it, we will do it lickety-split, and then we'll be able to talk about some other things down the road. Yes. Mr. President, uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, President Thank Arafat. You. President Arafat called on you, you Mr. President. You had to President. remind me that it was congratulations instead of condolences. <laughs> after this time. Uh, President Arafat called on you, Mr. President, to help him uh, move the peace process between the Palestinians and Israelis. And uh, on Mr. Arafat considers the whole situation is very urgent and serious due to the fact that there are many settlements which are brewing. And Mr. Sharon is uh, threatening to build more settlements in the West Bank before the final settlements with the Palestinians. In light of this and the choking closure on the Palestinians that you are very concerned about, several times you have expressed your opinion and desire to see the Palestinians working and getting everything. What are your immediate plans, Mr. President, to bring about implementation of the Oslo Accords as well as the Israeli-Palestinian agreement and all of the signatures that we have done here in Washington in the near future, sir? Thank you. I think the first and most important thing we can do is to nail the agreement on Hebron. You know, we were getting very, very close to an agreement on Hebron before uh, Chairman Arafat <clears throat> Had, had to leave to go for, to his trip to Europe. And um, I did what I could by bringing them, by bringing Prime Minister Netanyahu and Chairman Arafat here to meet with King Hussein and me. We, they, they began to establish a, at least the beginnings of a relationship uh, of a trust and interchange so that an agreement could be made on Hebron. If we can clear the Hebron hurdle, it has such emotional significance to both sides as well as such practical significance. I believe that will open the door to go on and, and, and fulfill all the other uh, challenges that are there before us. That's what I believe. Yes, sir, in the back. A hundred items that are on my agenda in this period after the election. All I can tell you is I think that to, to deal with the baby boom issues of Social Security and Medicare, we need a bipartisan commission and we need the longest possible timeline so we have to make the least painful possible changes. But that must not be, let me reiterate, that is not an, a reason not to go on and balance this budget and put 10 years on the Medicare Trust Fund. We need to do that now. Losing a year last year, I think, was an error. It may have been unavoidable, but it, it complicates all of our other balanced budget calculations. We need to go on and do it and start ratcheting down this, this spending issue. Go ahead, Karen. This is twice now you've been elected with less than 50 percent of the vote. How big of a disappointment was that to you, and is that going to hamstring you now? Not much. A 379 electoral votes was an enormous consolation prize. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after all, we, in, in many of the states that were battleground states, including two that were especially important to me, there were four candidates on the ballot that got substantial numbers of votes, in California and Oregon in particular. And so, uh, and I made a decision the last week that I wanted to go to some of the smaller states where we had some elections in play. And uh, my advisor said, now, if you do this, it'll cost you a couple of points on your popular margin. I said, you know, it's the right thing to do. We ought to go out there. If people were asking me to come and campaign, they thought it would make a difference. And I agreed to do it. I don't have any regret at all. You know, every, I never met a, a person in public life that didn't wish that he or she had gotten all the votes. So would I have liked a few more? Of course. But I'm very gratified by what happened. Yes, go ahead. Australia in about a week or so. What do you hope to accomplish there? And you're not going to visit its neighbor, New Zealand, at this time, but will you be reaching out to them uh, to increase the contacts with New Zealand and perhaps invite their ambassador here when they sort out their, their prime minister when they sort out their election? Well, we have, let me, let me just say, we, we have a good partnership with Australia. I've not had a chance, to, it, it's vital to our security interest in the area. I've not had a chance to meet with the new prime minister. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to going down there, and, and it'll be a nice thing for Hillary and for me. We've never been to Australia before. Um, and uh, we've also had a good relationship with New Zealand, and uh, Prime Minister Bolger and I work quite well together. And uh, we'll just have to cross that bridge when we come to it about where we go from there. But I'm feeling, uh, 
I'm, I'm anxious to go down there and do that because the, our relationships with Australia are a big part of our future in the whole Asian Pacific region. Yes, go ahead. No, Abdullah from Kuwait TV. Congratulations again. Uh, my question is, what would be uh, your administration's policy towards Iraq in order to guarantee and maintain the security of uh, the Gulf area in general and state of Kuwait in particular? Thank you. Well, the first thing we will do is maintain our, our firm policy that we have all along uh, uh, to let the Iraqis know that, that, that no action can be taken against Kuwait without dire consequences. When the Iraqi troops were massed, remember, down toward the Kuwait border uh, during my first term, we immediately moved military assets into the area and activated a plan for, for reaction. And I think that they can be under no illusion that any aggressive action could be taken without, against Kuwait without a stern response by the United States. Um, the other thing that I think we, we're focused on with Iraq, and we must continue to be, is just getting them to comply with the United Nations resolutions. I think that is also very important. I do not relish the suffering of the people of Iraq. I, the United States was one of the sponsors of the resolution which would allow us to allow them to sell oil in return for food and medicine. And when the UN can work out the mechanism for doing that in the aftermath of the unfortunate events involving the Kurds, I think that will go forward. But our policy will be the same. We must contain the ability of Iraq to threaten its neighbors. Yes, Mara. Mr. President, we just uh, finished an election where turnout was at a, rec at a record low. I'm wondering why you think that was and what you might have done to make it more interesting or compelling so that more people would have voted. I could have made it closer, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm concerned about it, you know, and there are all kinds of, there are, there are explanations you read which uh, are maybe reassuring, like, well, when times are pretty good, people maybe don't vote, and explanations you read which are discouraging. The more the negative ads are, the lower the turnout is. And I saw a very disturbing, uh, one of you on, on the television, I saw a, a series the other night about how local campaigns were now becoming also dominated by negative ads. Let me make a suggestion and say that I, I do not know the answer to it. I was elated at the enormous turnout in 1992. I felt good about it. Uh, but the, we had signals that this election would be a lower turnout election uh, quite a long while before we had the turnout. It, and the first indication I had for sure was when the viewership of the debates was so much lower than it was the year before. And you know, we got all our folks together and I said, we're gonna have a hard time getting our folks to the polls. And, uh, we need to really work on this. So I, I would, let me just throw it back to you and say that I would welcome any analysis anyone has about what we can do to get voting up. I strongly supported Motor Voter and other attempts to increase the registration base, thinking that that would increase the turnout. We have dramatically increased the number of people who are registered. There's been a huge increase in registration in the last four years. And uh, I'm disappointed that it wasn't accompanied by an increase in voting. And if you got any uh, more ideas, I saw Senator Feinstein on television saying that if we had a uniform poll closing, uh, that that would increase turnout in the western states. Uh, I, wish I, I, I wish I had a good opinion on it, but I'm open to doing something that will t increase it if you all have any good ideas. Yes? Mr. President. Mr. President. No, I'll take both of them. Go ahead. In some of during the campaign concerning the troubles in Northern Ireland, particularly from former Secretary of State Jim Baker, who called your trip to Ireland last year, Gullible's Travels. Uh, will you continue to try... <laughs> Did he say that? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> will you continue to try and assist in finding a solution to Northern Ireland, or do you find that, that there's just no solution to be had and no assistance the U.S. can provide? Well, the answer is I will continue to do whatever I can to be of assistance to the Irish and the... Um, British governments as long as they work for peace in Northern Ireland and to the other parties who are committed to peace. Uh, I, have, uh, I have supported the process which is now underway there. Uh, I don't think America could make a greater contribution than to have a man of George Mitchell's caliber there doing what he's doing. Uh, but I, um, and so I do not think that I have been in error in trying to help the Irish people come to grips with the hundreds of years of demons and, and put them aside and make peace. I think that, I, that, that we should continue to try. Uh, but it's obvious that there has to be uh, a genuine uh, cessation of violence and that all the parties have to be able to rely on one another not to start killing again, either in Northern Ireland or in Great Britain. 
uh, are in order for this peace process to go forward. But I, I, yes, I intend to continue to do what I can to encourage it. I stay in close touch with uh, Prime Minister Bruton and with Prime Minister Major, and we talk, obviously, uh, our people talk to the parties involved from time to time. Uh, and of course, uh, Senator Mitchell keeps us informed. And I would like to, uh, I, I very much hope in the next four years that we can make some contribution to the ultimate resolution of this. Yes. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, the Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement was the foreign policy pinnacle of your first term. As you seek a Secretary of State, will the first and foremost quality you look for in someone be the person who can get that process back on track? Well, <clears throat> the, the short answer to your question is that will be one thing I look for. Uh, and that is one of the most important things that happened in the last four years. Uh, continued reduction of our nuclear arsenals, the comprehensive nuclear trust ban treaty, the indefinite extension of the nonproliferation treaty, the, uh, the uh, end of stopping the North Korean nuclear program, all those things, mount, they count for a lot as well. But if you, if you look ahead, here's what I want a Secretary of State who can do, uh, to, to do. Number one, to continue our efforts to build the first undivided democratic Europe in history, uh, which means to affect the NATO expansion, working with the Secretary of Defense, uh, in a way that is in solidifies our partnership with the democratic Russia instead of undermining it. Number two, to continue to be a force for peace in the Middle East and Northern Ireland, working through the process in Bosnia and elsewhere. Number three, to meet the new security threats of terrorism and, and uh, organized crime and drug running and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and sophisticated traditional weapons and then to take advantage of the extraordinary economic opportunities for the United States in building a global economic structure that is increasingly more open and fair, uh, that will stabilize the rest of the world and help America's prosperity to continue. I don't think there's any way to, we don't have any scientific studies of this, but there's probably no way to calculate the enormous positive impact that the dramatic expansion of trade in the last four years has had on the changing mix of the new jobs in America. And over half of the new jobs, our 10.5 million, 10.7 million new jobs have come in high wage areas. There's no question that one big reason is the, the, the disciplined, organized, integrated efforts that have been made in the private and public sectors to expand trade. So I want a Secretary of State that can do all that. I guess that means I want a magician. One other thing I would say that we've learned from Warren Christopher, I made a, a, a reference to this yesterday. Uh, he is, uh, his, his sheer physical capacities are those of a person half his age. Uh, you cannot be an American Secretary of State today unless you are capable of withstanding the rigors of intense travel, followed by intense meetings, followed by more intense travel. So it's almost like you've got to be practically athletic to do as well as you need to do. But th those are the things that I want. Thank you very much.